Thank you, everyone, that served this morning, those that brought goodies. Um, may God bless you and enrich you for enriching us. And uh, everyone can have a part here. Uh, you all have something to contribute that will build up this body and take the mission of Christ from here into our community. And so it's exciting. This next week, I'm gone with Pastor Elijah and Ben, our worship intern. We're going to study the book of Revelation. So we're going to figure it all out. We'll come back to you, tell what, how it actually works now. Uh, what, just, you know, we've been, I've been, I used to do this every, every time I could, every year I'd go and, and see, it's important as a pastor that I have to, I have to keep digging deeper because otherwise, like, you know, this is oil country, the well runs dry. So I'm going, uh, with my team here of, of, of young men and we're going to study, uh, the book of Revelation. Scott Duvall is coming from, um, the Arkansas, Texas area. He's a, just the world, that's the top-rate New Testament scholar, written books, commentaries on the book of Revelation. So I'm excited about this. And I'm auditing, so I don't have to do any assignments. So that's perfect. You know, it's like, great, just just do, to take the class. So we're not going to be here. Call the elders if you have an emergency. Uh, we'll be back uh, next weekend. And I'm back on part two of this Acts chapter two that we're going to be in today. Um, June 19th is going to be a super exciting day. Because you're going to be able to share and hear stories of God's transforming power in the lives of people over the last period. Like during COVID, people came to know and to experience Jesus Christ in a very personal way. And that's a, and so we're going to celebrate that June 19th outside in a tub. We'll maybe put some warm water in there, but anyway, that, that's coming. But just, um, just I got to hear some of those stories this week, and I was just like, ah, oh, this is why we're here. It's just to see lives change. Now, there's also a period of time as young people where, as a teenager, you finally realize, yeah, this is mine, and I need to, I need to declare this. And so maybe there's a few of you out there, too, that are like, yeah, as a teenager, I've been, I believed as a young child. I've grown in my faith. I, I really am excited, and, 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 now, you know, and now I'm ready just to make that stand and say, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is where I'm going. And so that's... Because that's what we're going to see here in this passage. Luke chapter 2. Because the question is, what's next? Jesus disappears. The guys are looking to the sky, Acts chapter 1. And they're like, what are you doing looking? Just get going. The plan is now progressing. Move with the plan. The plan is go to Jerusalem and wait. And so they're waiting, they're waiting, waiting. Let me paraphrase what happens to you in Jerusalem. The day of Pentecost comes. This is a significant feast in the Jewish calendar celebrating first fruits. And, 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 this is, and so suddenly on the day of Pentecost, they're praying and, and boom. The spiritual realm intersects with the physical realm in a dynamic and visible way. Tongues of fire, this roaring sound. I mean, the, you can tell Luke is struggling to describe in physical terms some significant spiritual moment. He's like, I don't, I, I'm trying to explain this to you, but it's like this roar and flames of fire, and all of a sudden, a bunch of Galileans, like this, this would be like, you know, think of someone you know, from northern Saskatchewan that's never been out, you know, out of their lake country there. They're down in Calgary, and suddenly they start speaking Arabic and Ethiopian, and Eritrean, and, and Italian, and Spanish. You can just imagine, this is a, a group of, of localized northern, you know, Galilean Jews here in the city of Jerusalem, and suddenly they began to speak languages. And at that time of the feast, all these other Jews are in Jerusalem, perhaps some visiting, some maybe relocated, and they hear their own language. And they're like, I'm looking at those guys. There is no way they could speak my language because they've never even been to my country. And they're I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. The testimony of Jesus Christ in my own heart language. Some of you that grew up with a different language than English, you understand this. It is more natural to pray in your heart, your language of your birth, than it is the language that you now practice here in Canada. You, you, you get what I'm saying. So they, these, these Jews, oh, I grew up speaking that language, and now I hear it. And the question that they ask in verse 12, it's not on the screen, but of chapter 2 of Acts is, what does this mean? What does this mean? What is going on here? 
And, of course, there's some people that are like, oh, these guys are clearly drunk, right? Now, that's why they're doing it. This is, a, this is just a, a party gone bad. It's poured onto the street, and they're just going crazy, you know. And so, so this is the thing. Some people don't want to have to face the spiritual realities in this world. And so they'll just dismiss it. They'll just demean it. They'll just put it down. This happens in Lloydminster all the time. You know this. It's easier to make fun of someone, to be sarcastic to them, than it is to actually, actually consider something spiritual that's going on in their life. So you may have encountered that in your school, in your workplace, in your community, where people just, as opposed to just actually contemplating, considering what you're saying, they'll just put down your faith because they don't want to have to face any spiritual reality. But something significant, monumental has happened here. And so Peter gets up and he begins to preach. He's like, we're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Like, we're more sensible than that. You know, why would, you know, like, it's, but this is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And he quotes the, the, the prophet Joel. All these Jewish people in the, in the festival of, of Pentecost would, would know this passage. And he talks about how the day of the Lord would come and with signs and wonders. And the passage ends with this verse and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Every Jew knew this. Of course. Yahweh, the Lord, the, the covenant God. Of course. And so we find ourselves in verse 22 of chapter 2 of Acts. And he says to the men of Israel, this is his sermon, Peter. Peter the coward. Remember the one that, that denied Jesus? You know, the, the one who, who, had, who could talk lots, but the action didn't necessarily follow. Jesus reinstates him. And now Peter, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, gets up and speaks to this group. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man clearly attested to you by God with powerful deeds, wonders, miraculous signs that God performed among you through him, just as you know. I mean, you guys remember Jesus of Nazareth. You know, the, the, the rumors and the stories had been circulating for the last three years about this guy. Who is he? Is he a prophet? What's going on with him? And, and, and everyone knew that there were extraordinary things about Jesus. I mean, just over the hill in Bethany, right? It wasn't that far away that, that Lazarus came out of a tomb when Jesus called him forth. They remembered the story of the, the pool there in Jerusalem where Jesus went down and, and healed the man that had been crippled for years. Those stories just kept circulating. You, you know this Jesus of Nazareth. You know, God's power was manifested in Christ. You heard this. He says in verse 23, this man who was handed over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you executed by nailing him to a cross at the hands of Gentiles. He's like, okay, so you remember, powerful man, Jesus, and this man who, who was following God's plan, you happen to be part of that plan, but on the wrong side of the plan, because you handed him over to be executed on a cross at the hands of Gentiles. What seemed like just an out-of-control weekend of events, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, actually was a strategic plan of God to bring salvation into the world, the kingdom of God. He says there in verse 24, but God raised him up having released him from the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held in its power. So here's the reality. Jesus Christ, super powerful man who did all these amazing things. Not only that, he was crucified by you guys, although it was the plan of God, but God raised him up. The one thing that we're all afraid of, we're all uncertain of, we're all not sure about, he took care of once and for all on the cross. He's not dead anymore. His power is God's power. Peter is leading them to the point of having to, to, to agree or disagree. Is Jesus God? Yeah. God raised him up. And death no longer has control over Jesus. He has beaten that once and for all. He 
He says in verse uh, 32, we'll just jump ahead in the passage. This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses of it. We all saw this. We're telling you. And then he says, verse 33, So then exalted to the right hand of God, and having received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out what you see and hear. This gift of the Spirit is a proof of the exaltation of Jesus. And there's Jesus sitting up in the heavenly throne room, and, and he's sitting right next to his Father. And I mean, obviously God is not, you know, like corporeal. Like he doesn't have a body like us. But like it's, it's an image of, of power and of strength and of authority. It's the place of, of authority, right? So, you, you know, you're sitting right here, and so the Father and the Son would have this dialogue. Okay, what are we going to do now? Okay, yeah, let's, let's send Mike some help. He's trying to preach. He's struggling. He needs it right now. You know, would you, you know, let's, let's do that, you know. And, you know and this is how it works. You know, it's the place of authority, of consultation. You know, you, you, you get to just whisper in, in the Father's ear, yeah, yeah, let's do that, okay. Here he is in a place of exalted honor and power. But God's power is demonstrated in us. He's like, yeah, yeah the Father, Jesus is at the right hand, of, but he's sent down the Holy Spirit, and what you're witnessing is God's power in ordinary people. I mean, it was big that Jesus rose from the day, dead. I mean, the cross, and the empty tomb, and that was, you know, there he is, Jesus, ascended into heaven. But now, the very power of God is visibly manifesting itself in ordinary people. I mean, it's great that God could show his power through his son, Jesus, who is God. But to think that he wants to show his power in ordinary people, people's lives? He says there uh, in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. This is the Conclusion of the sermon. This is the, 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 the critical juncture, the TSN turning point, if you want to call it that. This is the game changer right here. He's speaking to a bunch of religious people, pious people, God-fearing, Bible-memorizing people, clean-living people, monogamous people. Drug-free people. I mean, I mean, this is these are clean. I mean, this this is as as as, as just pristine a group as you could have. And he's and he's like, look what you did. You crucified the Lord Christ Himself. The Jews looked for this coming deliverer. They called him the Messiah or the Christ. This anointed king who would come and bring salvation, redemption, freedom. They, they thought about it usually in political terms. But here now, he's like, this Jesus is Christ. And he's also Lord. He's God. Now, for a Jew, that was hard. Because they knew that there is one God. There is one Lord, the Lord alone. And now they're saying, so you're saying this guy that was here, did all these miracles, that died, that rose again, is the Lord? Then who have we been praying to all the time? Well, it's the same. And so they've got to, boom, kind of blow up their mind. They've, they've had a limited understanding of God. And now they're saying, here's another component. And not only that, but there's another component, the Holy Spirit. Wow, you mean God is three, but he's one? Yeah. Can you explain that? No. Is it true? Yes. Welcome to the Bible. <laughs> Just in case you think that you're smart, God puts these things in there to say, yeah. I am above you, and yet I come down to you, and I send my spirit to you. My plan and my power is real for you, if you would choose it. What does this mean? Peter's like, this is what it means. Jesus, the one you handed over to be crucified, who died and who rose again, who is now exalted to the right hand of the Father, has sent the Holy Spirit amongst us. That's what this means. 
God's power now is no longer working through his son. It's working through his spirit in the lives of his followers. Wow. Because we see in verse 37, the second question. When they heard this, they were acutely distressed or pierced to the heart, literally. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do, brothers? What does this mean? Well, he explains it. This is what it means. What should we do? God opens the door of opportunity for us. And we walk through it. He calls and invites throughout the scriptures. He says, come, know me, experience me, walk with me. La, 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 la. Let, let's have life together. And the story of the scriptures are, are men and women that choose to do that and men and women that don't choose to do that. And that's the story of, of life. And here, a group of people are faced to face with this decision. What should we do? Because if this is true, we're in deep trouble. How could we ever, ever be forgiven for what a horrendous thing we just were a part of? I mean, maybe they weren't actively there, in, you know, when the Sanhedrin condemning Jesus, but they didn't do anything to stop it, right? You know how it is in school, right? Maybe you're not the bully, but if you watch the bully take that kid's head and bang it into the locker and don't do anything about it, you're participating in the bullying. You can at least say, stop that, or, or hey, teacher, there's a kid getting their head bashed into a locker here. You know, like, involve, you need to step up and involve yourself. And, and so here they're like, we didn't do anything. Now what do we do? We didn't know. We didn't understand. We didn't get it. And they realized that their plan is not God's plan at that point. And you and I, I hope you get to that place in your life where you suddenly realize that whatever trajectory, whatever path you've been walking on is not God's path, because that's the key to getting onto God's path. As long as you think that your way is right, you, you, you'll never experience what God wants for you in your life. But when you get to that place, no matter where it is and, and, and what circumstances God brings in, but where you're like, okay, I've been going this way, but I realize God wants me to go this way. He's inviting me here. He says in verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, each one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing that God makes a way for these people? You stood by and watched the Son of Glory, the King of Glory, the very Messiah himself be crucified and mistreated and humiliated. And now the, the merciful Father in heaven says, oh yeah, just turn to me, believe in me, identify with my Son, Jesus Christ, and you'll be forgiven and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Even though you were part and parcel of this horrendous act, I am willing to forgive you. Repent. You know, there's different stages of this in, in our lives, and, and and it's important. I've been reading John Hatinga's book, the you know the loving leadership of Jesus, you know, following Christ, and he he talks about this because you know there, there's the first stage is, is is where we're like I'm I'm sick of it. Where you in your life reach a point of frustration, right? I am sick of my life. And that, that's a, a important first step, but, but it's not that you're not, you're not there yet. You're not at repentance yet. You're just frustrated. And everyone experiences that. But then, of course, the next step is that, is that stage of, I'm sorry. You feel guilty about it. You, you feel shame. Um, some people are sorry when they get caught, right? There's others that, that come clean and, and, and confess their guilt, but, but they're, all, they're all sorry, and you, and you, don't, you want to get rid of the shame, and the guilt. But, th but then there's the, the, the next level is that level of surrender where, where, where you acknowledge that, that my feeble attempts at self-leadership and self-government of my own kingdom have not worked. And I now give control completely over to Jesus Christ. This is repentance. 
You may have grown up in a good church home, attended Sunday school camps, VBS, and you know done all the little things that good Christian families do, but never have come to a point in your life where you surrender. And usually when you surrender, you, you, you can't retain ownership and control. You, you give over that control. He's okay, it's all yours. And, and, and Peter's saying, look, here's what God invites you to do. Give control of your lives and of your future and, and experience God's power and plan by turning to Jesus Christ. It's pictured visibly when you are baptized. Because that is a symbol of your life dying to Christ, buried with him in death, and then rising to new life. I'm not the same person I used to be. Repentance. And you receive this forgiveness, the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is a change of mind which leads to a change of direction. I don't know if you saw that movie, The Blind Side. There's, there's a critical moment in that movie where Leanne Toy is, is driving with her family and there's Michael Orr walking in the rain and with his T-shirt and shorts and a little bag and, 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 you know, she, and they have this little dialogue and then they drive away you know, because they just let him keep going. He's, going. he's going to the gym, it's dry, it's warm there. And, and, and then she turns to her husband as they're driving away and she says, turn around. Turn around. And they turn around and... They go, and the rest of the story, of course, is he, they come, he comes into their family and, and he becomes a successful football player and ultimately to the NFL, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's a great kind of story of, you know, from the bottom to the top kind of thing. But, but there's, that, there's that moment in the movie. And even she shares about it in real life, the, the real woman who, who the movie's based on, who it's not always accurate, but she talks about that turnaround moment. As a believer in Jesus Christ, which says, we just, I just felt this conviction. Turn around. we got to do something about this. Well, this is that personal moment in your life where you're like, I've been going here, and now I need to go there. You change your mind about Jesus. You change your mind about what you've been doing, and you accept his plan. You receive his power, and you walk according to his purposes. Many professing Christians are frustrated in their experience because they haven't repented. They want to be forgiven. They want to have the guilt to go away, but they don't want a leader. That's not really following Jesus. When you say, okay, I I want you, Jesus, but I'm going to still have my own standard of sexual morality. I'm still going to do with my money, with my money, whatever I want to do with my money. I'm still going to to decide how I'm going to plan for my future on my own, but I just want you to save me, Jesus. And he's like, that's not the conditions here. I want to be your king. Do you think that I, the creator of the universe, the savior of the world, the redeemer of all people, could have a better plan for you than what your puny mind has come up with? Trust me. Right, no, 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 I got a better plan. I got a better plan. I got a better plan. I got a little lake lot up here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Jesus, let me get in there. It'll mess with your plan, but you'll discover a better plan. It won't be absent of suffering or of difficulty or of trial, but it will be full of glory and joy. Repent. Turn around. Despite their enormous guilt, God offered them tremendous grace. doesn't matter how low you've gone. The Father in heaven, his Son, Jesus Christ, look down with you and say, the offer's open. Come. Join our family. Just like Leanne Tuoy and Blindside, you know, invites Michael Orr into their car, into their house, gives them a bedroom and a bed and eventually a truck. I mean, I mean, this is what the Father's doing to us. He's like, come join my family right now. I'm just going to walk in the rain with my shopping bag and sleep in the gym. That's my plan. And God's like, I got a way better plan for you. And I got the power to go with it. Believe in me. You see that there? Verse thirty. Eight. Oh, sorry, verse 39. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. 
He's like, it's for you guys here, but, but you know who he's talking about in this passage? He's talking about me. He's talking about my parents and Prince George in the 70s hearing the gospel and responding to Jesus Christ to as many as the Lord will call to himself. He's talking about the people here at New Life in the last year who have come to that TSN moment in their own life where they're like, oh, I need something. Jesus provided it, I believe. And, and their lives are different. That's what he's talking about. The promise. God keeps his promises. And it says there in verse 40, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, save yourselves from this perverse generation. I mean, it's kind of a classic old Bible Baptist preaching there, right? You know, you know, get away from this corrupt. But what he's saying is all the trajectories that this world offers you lead nowhere. They're twisted, curved, distorted roads that lead to dead ends. There's only one way out, and that way is Jesus. The career is not going to save you. Huge amount of money in the bank, not going to save you. You can have 20 kids, that's not going to save you. A, a successful family, not going to save you. You could be the top end of your athletic career, hit the peak Super Bowl, NBA championship, you know, a Stanley Cup, whatever it is. It's not going to save you. Save yourself. And the way to do that is through Jesus Christ. And the summary in verse 41 is very interesting. They, those who accepted his message were baptized. So these people do what he's told them to do. You can repent and, 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 you know, and believe. And, 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 and so suddenly, all of a sudden, there's this huge baptismal service. 3,000 people were added that day. They figure it was 120. It might have been 500 because that's how many viewed him at one time after his resurrection. But, I mean, the, the church grows exponentially at this moment. It's like, boom, boom, boom. Suddenly there's 3,000 people in Jerusalem who believe in Jesus, who now have received the Holy Spirit, who are God's active agents experiencing his power, demonstrating his power, sharing and testifying to Jesus Christ throughout Jerusalem. This is what's going on here. And the story continues. And it changes the way they interact even with each other, which we'll see next week. But I'm inviting you to reconsider where you stand with Jesus today. He's not talking to a bunch of prostitutes and gamblers and gangsters and gangbangers here. He's not talking, he's talking to church people here. He's talking to the people that you sit next to the pew with. I mean, he's talking to devout religious people, and he's saying, repent. And we who grew up in the church sit there with smug smiles because we don't need to repent. I'm good. Because you can go to school and go to work and you can see sin all around you. Oh. But then God's word comes and says, no, you, religious, good, clean, living, Bible-memorizing, camp-attending people need to repent. You need to turn your lives and orient them around the King, Jesus Christ, and surrender. And say, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. Then you know you've hit repentance when you're like, my plan is over. Now I'm on your plan, and I'm experiencing your power in that moment. You see, repentance is, there is that one kind of critical moment where you're like, yes, my life is no longer this, it's now this. But then it becomes a daily reality. It's a lifestyle. You know, the, the New Testament talks about it, right? Where Paul would say, I die daily. What does he mean? It means he has to wake up some mornings and say, whew, I am out of alignment. I need to realign with Jesus. I'm repenting and getting back into the gospel trajectory, the good news, and, and following Jesus, right? Because you, you realize, I've got a behavior. I've got an attitude. I've got an action. I've got a habit that doesn't reflect my king. And we all do. We have to get in a habit of, of turning, of returning to God, of experiencing that forgiveness and that grace. You, you will be convicted of an unloving attitude. 
And that's where you repent and realign. You'll be convicted of, of just selfishness in any number of areas of your life and your personal habits, your time, your money, whatever it is, and, and you'll realign that. You'll be convicted of, of, of just the, the way things come out of your mouth, and, and, and that's where the Holy Spirit will help you to, to reflect your king in your life. This is a lifetime trajectory. And as we let the Holy Spirit have more control, more access to every point of our life, we become more like Christ. But it's a habitual repentance, because when he brings us to, to mind and we don't, then he says, okay, you're stuck. Until you want to move with me, I'm leaving you there. But, but I want to carry you, so just repent. Move with me. Repent. And change happens. We experience that forgiveness, the power, and the purpose that God wants for us. This is what's next. So if you've not had that significant moment of, yes, this is now my life, I believe, I'm orienting my life towards Jesus Christ, I, I, I'm, I confess my, my sinfulness, my selfishness, and I receive Christ, and I'm pointing to him, and then Christians say, yes, no, I, I am now surrendered to your lordship. That doesn't mean, yeah, I'm saved, I'm good, I'll make my own decision. No, I'm now following your plan, your orders, your direction. Even when it makes no sense to those around me, I will follow you. The whole world was changed at this moment. The Holy Spirit comes in. No longer is, is, is God working through one representation, his son on earth, but now he's, he's boom, blasting his power into every follower of Jesus Christ, even until this day. But some of us don't feel very powerful, do we? But as you surrender, you will experience his power. And he will work through you in ways you never dreamed possible. Would you move and align yourself with God's plan and power today? It's all centered around Jesus Christ. Team, would you come? You're going to lead us in a closing song here. And what does this mean and what should we do? And, and I hope you can answer those questions in your heart today. Uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and exalted, just is the anchor of the book of Acts. And on that truth, the Holy Spirit changes our lives and moves us forward as we share this good news with our community, with, with our world. And so would you pray with me as the team prepares to lead us in a song of, of focus as we, as we leave this, this place this morning. If you don't know Christ as your Savior today, I just invite you to, to repent, to turn away from whatever you were believing in and to believe in him today. And you can say some words. The words, you know, I mean, God knows your heart, but you say, Lord, I, I turn away from my sinfulness, my selfishness, and I turn to you, my Savior. I believe you died for me, you rose again. May your kingdom come, may your will be done in my life today. He promises to, to forgive your sin, to give you his Holy Spirit, and to, to empower you to be on his plan and his purpose with his power. Lord, may we live lives of daily repentance and forgive us even today of the failures of this past week. May we align ourselves with you daily as we come to you in your word. As your spirit got, convicts us of our sin, may we turn and and repent and discover forgiveness. And Lord, I know you have a plan here in your life, in each person's life that's here. And I pray that that would be experienced even this week as we surrender and follow you. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture says in the book of Jude, now to the one who is able to keep you from falling, to cause you to stand rejoicing without blemish before his glorious presence to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and for all eternity in God's people say. Amen. If you'd like to continue just some work with the Lord, Pastor Elijah and I will be here if you want to pray with us. We're, we're happy to meet with you or talk to you anytime. But may you go in God's power this week. God bless you.